Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Medeiros. I am the president of the Chesapeake Region Safety Council. We are a regional independent chapter of the National Safety Council, and our mission is to educate and influence people to prevent accidental injury and death. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't do something here. I have a little shameless plug, and I want to say happy birthday to all my Marine Corps brothers and sisters today. All right. Uh, but I did want to introduce our, our speaker today, who is, uh, wow, I can't say enough good things about this woman, because every time she gets up and has an opportunity to speak, it's just all kinds of great stuff we get to hear. And she's going to talk to us today about the state of uh, uh, COVID-19 and OSHA enforcement. But uh, our speaker, her name is Adele Abrams. Adele is attorney. A uh, safety professional and a trainer who's the president of the law office of Adele Abrams, PC, in Beltsville, Maryland, Charleston, West Virginia, Colorado. It's a multi attorney uh, firm focusing on uh, safety and health and employment law nationwide. Adele is a certified mine safety professional. She also provides consultation, safety audits, training, service and services to uh, MSHA and OSHA regulated companies. Well, one of the things that's very important to me is Adele is the CEO of the Chesapeake Region Safety Council. And uh, I could go on and on and talk about Adele, but she is a, a just a very well-respected, very knowledgeable professional. And I will, without going on and on and on, I'd rather let Adele take the floor because she's got a lot of stuff and I can guarantee you that you will get some valuable information about out of what Adele has to talk about today. So without further ado, Adele, take the floor, please. Okay, well, thank you, Dave, and uh, I'll try to live up to that introduction. Uh, and good morning to everybody. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of material here today, so uh, fasten your seatbelts. And uh, as Dave said, I'm going to talk about OSHA enforcement uh, and there's, believe it or not, there's, again, new stuff to talk about, uh, even this week, literally. Um, and then I'm going to go through the four state plan OSHA's uh, rules. Uh, they have come out with emergency temporary standards. Three of them are in effect now. And again, you're on the cutting edge because one of them just uh, is uh, was announced this week uh, and actually takes effect next week. Uh, the fourth one is, is still under development. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to take a look kind of at the political framework again a little bit on how that may affect uh, some of uh, at least federal OSHA's activities going forward. So that's a bit of the roadmap here uh, for you. And again, hang on. Um, so first of all, uh, federal OSHA, um, you know, if I were a diagnostician, I'd be putting them on some kind of uh, psych meds at this point because they're definitely demonstrating bipolar disorder or, or schizophrenia. Uh, they have been all over the place in their response uh, to COVID, starting with their guidance in March when they said, don't wear any masks. Then they flipped it around. Then in April, they were saying they weren't going to be doing any enforcement on COVID at all unless it was in uh, medical facilities and they didn't want things being reported. Uh, then they got called up before Congress, and so in May, uh, which is the latest in terms of the enforcement guidance, uh, and I've given you uh, the link there, um, they did a backflip again, and they suddenly said, yes, we are going to be doing all of our regular enforcement activities. We are going to be looking at COVID across all different industry sectors, uh, not just in uh, the medical and and related things uh, like uh, funeral facilities, uh, other high risk like corrections. They were, they were looking at those initially, uh, but remember federal OSHA doesn't have any public sector uh, jurisdiction. So any facilities uh, like correctional facilities that are, are uh, publicly run uh, in federal OSHA states like Pennsylvania, for example, or West Virginia, uh, they still weren't able uh, legally to go in and do anything in those facilities. Uh, so at this point, this uh, May 19th guidance, uh, they are doing regular in-person inspections. They're back to doing their site-specific targeting and national emphasis program. So they're not just doing COVID anymore. And they said, again, in a backflip, 
They are going to be investigating injury and illness reports. They're not just going to send out the RRI letters. Uh, and, you know, beyond that, uh, you know, they, they can take action uh, against uh, employers under the general duty clause. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. And under the other standards that they have, uh, it, the tools in their toolbox, respiratory protection rules, sanitation standards, uh, uh, things of that nature. Um, now, in terms of federal OSHA doing anything uh, broadly, uh, <laughs> When we set this up, I was thinking, oh, this is great. We're going to be doing this on uh, November 10th. The election will be last week. I can, you know, opine, you know, very wisely about what it's going to be under a Biden administration. And now everything has been, you know, kind of thrown up in the air a little bit. Um, I can tell you, this is just my prediction, um, if, in fact, the Biden administration is seated, as uh, in the White House, uh, as the head of the executive branch, uh, we're going to be dealing with a whole new federal OSHA. I would imagine that uh, it wouldn't be very long before they would rise to the occasion and probably fast track the infectious disease rule that they had uh, almost ready to launch as a proposal at the end of the Obama administration. But then it was taken, you know, not only onto the side burner or the back burner, I think it was off the stove entirely. So they really do have a rule that would cover not only COVID, but other infectious diseases ready to launch. Um, and I would think that that will happen in short order. However, they might also, uh, again, Federal OSHA, do something along the lines of an emergency temporary standard, which the, uh, the Trump administration OSHA has fought tooth and nail. They rejected congressional calls for this. They rejected the union's petition for an emergency temporary standard. And then when the unions filed in court, they argued in court that OSHA shouldn't have to do an emergency temporary standard. And they won. Uh, MSHA, by the way, won as well. Uh, and that's a, another story for another day, a bit more disturbing because MSHA doesn't have a general duty clause. So there is no gap filler there. Uh, but again, if we have a new sheriff in town, as they like to say, I think we will have a more cohesive national approach to dealing with COVID in the workplace. And even with the very promising news that we've had this week, uh, uh, both in terms of a treatment uh, as well as a potentially efficacious vaccine, it's still going to be a while. We're still going to be dealing with this in 2021. So um, in terms of federal OSHA, you know, I, I, that's we'll talk a little bit more about a couple of other things, but that's really where things stand. Definitely no rule coming out at the federal level until we have a new administration. Now, as we're going to talk about in more detail here, uh, the state plan states have started picking up the slack there, um, in part because of clusters, I think, not only in the medical side, but also, uh, as they call it euphemistically, the protein processing industry, uh, also known as chicken and meatpacking plants. And Virginia, our, our, uh, one, of, one of our states here under Chesapeake Region Safety Council, uh, they now have a fully enforceable emergency temporary standard in effect. A permanent rule is under development. Uh, the emergency standard technically expires in February, uh, but it can be extended. And, uh, you know, at the same time, you also have a, a rather ticked off employer community who feel that this rule was kind of ramrodded through. And it is a very detailed rule. I'm gonna spend the most time on that a little bit later in our, our uh, class here. Uh, I, I, I will say I attended a four hour class on the Virginia rule right after it came out uh, that that uh, Chesapeake Region Safety Council put on. And I walked out of there with my head spinning and more questions, I think, you know, than, than I had walked in with. And I've done a deep dive on that rule since then, uh, but there's still a lot of variables. So um, I can understand why, you know, some of these groups, the construction groups especially, uh, are up in arms over it. Um, now, Oregon OSHA, uh, we're going to talk about that later. They just finalized their emergency temporary standard, and it takes effect uh, later this month. Michigan OSHA, they came out of left field last month with, you know, boom, they had a, a fully uh, adopted emergency temporary standard uh, because it was it was timed uh, to to link up with the expiration of some of the, the uh, Michigan state emergency declarations. Um, and it's important to note here, I think, that in Oregon, 
uh, and in Michigan, though those state OSHAs had been kind of deputized to enforce the state COVID rules. So Oregon OSHA, even without an emergency temporary standard in place um, and not resorting to their general duty clause, they issued something like 92 citations against different employers for COVID over the course of the summer. Um, and so, you know, the state plans have more flexibility because they are state run. They can, you know, if they are, like, as I said, deputized uh, by the governor, uh, they have authority to enforce those orders and go into workplaces. Um, they also, of course, have their own rulemaking bodies. And uh, uh, not only are we dealing with those, but Cal OSHA um, is now looking to fill the gap as well. And Cal OSHA has an Occupational Safety and Health Standards Board. Uh, Virginia has a standards board. Maryland, um, people may be saying, what about Maryland? You know, uh, uh, Chesapeake's headquarters are in Maryland. Uh, Maryland is an interesting case. There has been a, a letter sent over to the governor basically pointing to what these other state plans are doing and going, uh, how about us? How about us? Um, and so far, Maryland OSHA has been reluctant to do an emergency temporary standard. Um, you know, is this political? Um, I will point out that Virginia, Oregon, Michigan, and California are all state plan states in states with a Democratic governor. And Maryland is a state plan state with a Republican governor. Uh, we haven't seen North Carolina or South Carolina or Tennessee or Kentucky jumping in you know, or Indiana jumping in. So it tends to be, I hate to say it, a blue state, red state thing again, uh, you know, just, just another uh, day in hell, I guess. Um, we're, for employers now, you're gonna be dealing with a real crazy quilt of differing regulations. If you are a multi-state employer, um, you know, or, or even better yet, a national employer, one of, you know, one of the uh, major companies that are members here, uh, you're gonna have to, be adapting your programs to deal, you know, at the federal level with the minimum that they're asking for, which is nothing enforceable, unfortunately. Uh, and then these, this again, you know, crazy quilt of these potentially evolving state plan emergency temporary standards. All four of these rules, and we're going to talk about each of them and their nuances, uh, they're temporary. <laughs> That's what ETS means. They are all four of those states looking at adopting permanent standards, but they are already, you know, articulating the fact that what they're gonna have in a permanent rule addressing infectious diseases is different than what they determined was feasible to do on a short-term basis. There's gonna be heavier lifting in all likelihood, uh, you know, once we get to these permanent rules and the programs that you're putting together now, there'll likely be some kind of grandfathering in and I'm sure there will be a phase in period uh, in any case, uh, but it doesn't mean that this is a once and done activity. And that's really what I wanna stress to you. You can't just develop a plan now under the Virginia OSHA rule and put it on your shelf and assume that you're good to go. You will, however, wanna look at, you know, at all of these rules kind of as a whole, uh, because just for example, you know, let's say you have operations in Michigan and Virginia um, and Maryland and DC, uh, you've now got three different state plans plus a federal uh, jurisdiction. Can you, you know, legally, can you morally and ethically afford your employees in Virginia having documented training and the, uh, you know, really kick-ass risk assessment that you've done in Virginia, and then look at your work site in DC, where you're basically doing nothing because you're under federal OSHA, you know, other than wearing a face mask um, and having some hand sanitizer. Um, and are they going to import your knowledge of how to do a plan and the need for a plan uh, for enforcement under the general duty clause? Uh, not only could federal OSHA do that, but for example, Maryland OSHA could do that as well. So uh, they can use your efforts 
in state A to support a gap filler general duty clause citation in state B. And that's really kind of the takeaway I want you to have as we go through this information. Um, so moving along here, we're going to go back to federal OSHA here for just a moment um, because uh, they have new stuff coming out uh, again, you know, with the within uh, in some of this we're going to talk about within the last week. Um, but reporting, let's start with reporting. Uh, this is a, a big sea change. Under OSHA's severe injury reporting rule, you have to notify OSHA within eight hours of a fatality that is work-related, and you have to notify them within 24 hours of a worker uh, being admitted for inpatient hospitalization, having an amputation, full or partial, or the loss of an eye, and they're literally talking about the eyeball coming out, not just having a splinter in the eye. Um, and if you fail to notify OSHA within the requisite period of time, it's a mandatory minimum $5,000 penalty. So right out of the gate, that's kind of a big deal. Um, this is another example of where OSHA is giving everybody whiplash because up until uh, September 30th, the guidance that they were giving indicated that, you know, if a worker dies of COVID, you know, within 30 days uh, of contracting it, you have to notify uh, OSHA and, and that's under part 1904. Um, and this is, again, the notification within eight hours. They said before, if someone was hospitalized with COVID, you would notify OSHA within 24 hours. And they were interpreting that as the, the trigger, triggering event being the manifestation of symptoms. So if somebody spiked a fever on Monday and then they were hospitalized on Tuesday, that would be within 24 hours and you would notify OSHA. Well, that has all changed now. And as of the end of September, they, they still want you to report the fatalities if somebody dies within 30 days, but they're interpreting the triggering incident now as being when that individual worker was exposed to COVID. Yeah, there, there's no way of knowing that, period. You know, very few cases, especially since contact tracing is generally not required by, by OSHA, um, there's no real way to know unless literally uh, they're here only with one other worker and you know the day that they produce symptoms and you were working with them that day, maybe then you could pinpoint it. But OSHA is now saying that because the epidemiologists are indicating that you are not going to contract or, or become symptomatic of COVID until two or more days have passed, and they're even using that for the testing. Um, OSHA saying, you're never gonna be hospitalized within 24 hours of being exposed to COVID, therefore no hospitalization cases need to be reported. Whew, that is huge. And that basically has gutted OSHA's ability to be aware of clusters, for example. You know, if that rule had been applied back when the first protein plant outbreaks uh, occurred, OSHA would never have known about it. Um, so in terms of surveillance, uh, this is really, uh, as I said, kneecapped the agency's ability uh, to do that. But that is just at the federal level, okay? So that's where, again, you're now gonna be in never, never land because that does not align with what Virginia wants. It does not align with what Oregon wants or Michigan. Um, California's rules are totally different. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. Uh, and so again, now you're gonna have to train your managers that in federal OSHA states, you don't report it, but in you know some of the state plan states, you may have to report it. Now, what about going on the log? Um, <laughs> yeah, duh. now they're saying it is recordable. And so this is another uh, example where you would not be reporting the hospitalization, but you might have to put it on your log if you determine that it is work related. Um, you know, and again, you could be hospitalized, you know, five days after you you're exposed. At that point, you know, it goes on your log because if you determine that it's work related. So you're going to be having a lot of, uh, you know, lack of harmony between your record abilities and your report abilities um, and federal OSHA as of now 
uh, is saying that you must put it on your, your OSHA 300 and 301 logs if there is objective evidence that a COVID-19 case may be work-related, may, and the evidence was reasonably available to the employer. In other words, you cannot play ostrich. You can't stick your fingers in your ears and say, I don't want to know about it if anybody's sick here. Um, you're going to have to do your due diligence investigation. And how do you do that? Um, I'm going to uh, point to the Cal OSHA uh, kind of triage evaluating cases. And I think that's a pretty good framework. So, so we'll look at that here a little bit later. Um, so that is the big change in terms of OSHA, federal OSHA recording and reporting. But again, your mileage may vary in the state plan states. Um, another thing that OSHA has been a little bit uh, equivocal about is the issue of worker notice. Now, at this time, federal OSHA does not require employers to notify other workers if one of their employee, their coworkers has COVID. But you do have to take steps to protect the other workers. You have to clean and disinfect the work environment. You have to notify other workers to monitor themselves. And you can also implement as an alternative a screening program, um, you know, which you should be doing anyway, in my view. Um, but here's the kicker. Um, I have a client in, in uh, D.C., so they're under federal OSHA, under this. And OSHA has just served them with a hazard complaint. Uh, because an employee filed a complaint, and this is up at the Lithicum office, uh, you know, federal OSHA, uh, claiming that other co-workers had COVID and the employee or failed to notify them about it. So OSHA is literally sending out an investigation letter that we're in the process of responding to. At the same time, they're saying you don't have to notify other workers. So, you know, they're, they're again, a little bit schizo on this point. Um, now, OSHA... You know, as I said, they can still pursue these hazard complaints. And once they come in for to investigate a hazard complaint, anything they see in plain view uh, is eligible. Uh, if employees bring up other non COVID related concerns while OSHA is in there interviewing them, obviously you can be off to the races on a bigger inspection. Um, OSHA is still pursuing whistleblower complaints about uh, COVID. A lot of these deal with work refusals. And the way it works, uh, no pun intended, if you have a fear, reasonable, good faith belief that your workplace is a, a COVID uh, haven and you have brought these concerns to the employer's attention and the employer refuses to respond appropriately, you know, by disinfecting, cleaning the place, uh, you know, doing other measures to satisfy you, then at that point, you do have the right to refuse to work. And that is protected activity under Section 11C of the OSHA Act. Um, we'll talk later on about Virginia. And in the Virginia emergency standard, they have expressly codified uh, this work refusal right. Uh, but this has always been something recognized. It's not unique to COVID. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you have a concern about COVID for those employees on this call, you have to go through the process. Give your employer a chance to cure the situation unless they have already shown animus, hostility toward whistleblowers, you know, the last three people who raised a concern immediately were fired, then you don't have to. Then you can go straight to OSHA uh, with the complaint um, and, and you can refuse to work. So that is going to be one of the bigger things. And from everything that I've understood statistically, uh, OSHA's uh, enforcement folks are swamped with uh, whistleblower complaints about COVID uh, especially. Um, and a lot of them do uh, uh, emanate from this, this tension over the work refusal rights. Um, now, at the same time, OSHA is saying you don't have to uh, notify other workers. The CDC's guidance for business and employers is saying that you should determine which of your employees may have been exposed to COVID and then notify them about that. Um, in addition, the EEOC has tons uh, and constantly evolving, I might say, uh, tons of frequently asked questions and answers about things like medical screening, how the Americans with Disabilities Act factors into this, how the Family and Medical Leave Act factors into this, uh, how HIPAA, uh, how the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act factor into all of this, uh, because suddenly you've got supervisors who are screening other workers, and you know normally under HIPAA that would be a huge no-no. Uh, right now, you have a safe harbor, but um, it's just like with OSHA and with CDC and NIOSH, 
Um, I recommend bookmarking the EEOC's page on COVID along with these other agencies and keep checking back because they slide new things in all the time. A um, couple of new things that got slid in, by the way, um, in, in uh, July, OSHA out of the blue issued a final rule uh, with the intent of, quote, preserving worker medical privacy and streamlining agency review of medical records during inspections. That is the often dreaded record review when they do the, the long audit of your 300, 301 logs. Uh, they typically talk to your workers to find out if there are missing uh, injuries or illnesses, including COVID, obviously. Um, and also they would normally go through your workers comp and other personnel files to verify that everything that is should appropriately be on the log is in fact on the log. That's how they do it. Well, this rule out of nowhere came out the end of July and it has established a new position of medical records officer at OSHA headquarters in Washington. And now all federal OSHA field uh, inspectors, those are compliance, safety and health officers, we like to call them that too. Um, now in order for them to get access to those employee personnel and medical records that, that actually identify the person, uh, they're gonna have to get permission from this dude, uh, or maybe it's a dude at, I don't think they've even put anybody in the position yet at headquarters. Um, so it seems like this has been a new roadblock that has been put in the, in the way of OSHA inspectors verifying, for example, that all COVID cases are being logged. Um, there are some exceptions to that. They can still access this information um, if worker health uh, enforcement is a concern. So if there were a complaint about COVID, they should be able to get into the records then. And also if they are cooperating with NIOSH on surveillance or, or uh, research that they might be doing. Um, but this is, uh, this is kind of a game changer in a lot of ways. And, you know, this is something that perhaps uh, if the Senate flips, could be rescinded under the Congressional Review Act come January, similar to the way uh, the, the Red uh, Congress and President Trump rescinded OSHA's continuing violation rule back in uh, 2017. So, you know, it, it's kind of a game, you know, when Clinton did the ergonomic standard, the first thing they did under Bush and the Red, Red uh, Congress there was to rescind that. And that's why we don't have an ergonomic standard. So uh, I would expect that we may see something come up about this, uh, assuming that there is a change in administration. Um, now, uh, another thing I wanted to note uh, at the federal level here is uh, to remember that when the electronic record keeping rule was modified in 20, well, actually it was created in 2016, it was modified uh, again in 2018, uh, but it does uh, embed protections against retaliation of workers. And so if, you know, workers claim that they have been retaliated against uh, for complaining about COVID, they are no longer limited to uh, the remedies in Section 11C of the OSH Act, which only has a 30-day statute of limitations. Now they could file a complaint with, with OSHA uh, under Part 1904, claim that they were uh, retaliated against for reporting an injury or an illness or for engaging in a work refusal. And OSHA now has six months, 180 days, to investigate and cite the employer. Um, and as relief uh, for abatement, they could order the restoration of the workers' uh, employment or if they were demoted, they, you know, restoration of seniority or benefits, et cetera. And so uh, the electronic record keeping rule was a backdoor way of exploding the OSHA whistleblower statute of limitations from 30 days to 180 days. The employers now can also be fined up to $134,937 federally, um, you know, for violating the rights. There's a lot in here. Um, I don't want to turn this into a, a webinar on that particular issue, but just be aware, you have to have the poster up. You have to have reasonable reporting requirements. You have to train your workers on their right to report an injury or illness that does include illnesses without any kind of retaliation. Um, you cannot discharge or demote people or transfer them um, or take away their overtime because they reported illnesses or injuries. Um, and expect in the next administration, there will be greater whistleblower enforcement. Uh, they've had this tool 
uh, since uh, basically the end of uh, December uh, 1st, 2016, but we had a change in administration, you know, a month later, and they haven't used it as much as I think the next administration will. Um, there's also, again, federal OSHA brand new guidance. This is the one that only came out last Friday, so it's less than a week old on ventilation in the workplace. And this is a, a big one, guys and gals, because uh, if you have stationary work sites, federal OSHA is now saying, you know, you want to ensure that you have adequate ventilation through your work environment. And this is the kind of thing, uh, although they cannot take an OSHA policy or, or, you know, guidance like this and directly enforce it under the federal general duty clause, if you know, if you're doing this uh, as part of your programs, they can then say your own programs recognize this. And if you don't maintain the controls, then they could cite you under the general duty clause. If your industry association, you know, maybe you're an AGC member or, you know, an NFIB member or a member of NAM or the chamber, if they put out guidance on this and you're a member, knowledge of that is imputed to you. And then OSHA can enforce it. So uh, there are backdoor ways. Uh, but in, in particular, and I want you to keep this slide in mind as we go uh, through the state plan rules, which I promise we are getting to, um, some of those have ventilation requirements in there, but they're very vague. And so this new OSHA guidance on ventilation fills in a bit of the holes in the state OSHA emergency temporary standards, Virginia especially. So while the federal policy is not mandatory, um, you know, it is something that the state enforcers can point to as something to benchmark it. And in addition, if we do have a, a federal OSHA emergency standard uh, or even an infectious disease uh, rule next year under a, a Biden administration, you can expect that this, these uh, policies here on ventilation systems would be incorporated in there. So, uh, you know, these are right now best practices, they're recommendations, they're not technically directly enforceable by OSHA, but could be uh, imputed in uh, through various means. So what they recommend, first of all, is uh, that employers work with HVAC professionals um, and look at steps to optimize building ventilation. Um, I work with a lot of mechanical contractors, so I'm sure they're really delighted about this uh, uh, these days. Uh, but think about that. You know, a lot of employers do not have their own build, their own engineers. This is going to require you to get somebody to take a, a look at this. And for those employers who don't own their buildings and may not control their ventilation system, and you know, my my firm is one of those. Um, you're going to have to talk perhaps with your building owner uh, or your building management company and make sure that they're doing the right thing as well. Um, now, the steps that are, rec and, and by the way, if you do that, document, document, document. And that way, if your building uh, owner refuses to do it, you may be locked in because of a lease, but it is going to at least put you in a defensible posture that you've you've uh, made made your best efforts to do that. Now. Once you've consulted with the HVAC professionals, um, what OSHA is recommending is that you ensure that the systems are fully functional. Uh, that's kind of a big duh. But also they, they say, you know, be mindful of those that may have been shut down for a period of time uh, or those that may be operating at some kind of reduced capacity during the pandemic. Maybe you've got, uh, you know, certain wings of your, your building shut down because you're only selling, you're not manufacturing. Um, that is going to impact how your system operates. Um, they also uh, said to remove or redirect personal fans uh, from blowing from one worker to the other. Um, I have a couple of employees at my firm who like to have those little fans, you know, by their desk, uh, because like many of your buildings, our building is hermetically sealed. You can't open the windows. Um, you know, sometimes people use it to cool off for medical reasons. Uh, you're going to have to stop that. Um, you know, unless somebody is in a, a discreet office where they're the only person in there and other workers don't enter that area. Um, they say use HVAC systems with a MERV rating of 13 or higher where feasible. Um, that is, again, that's a big one filling in the gaps in, in uh, specifications for some of these uh, other state plan rules. Um, 
they say increase the HVAC system's outdoor air intake, uh, you know, if you can, um, and also open windows and fresh air sources where possible. Um, once again, in our offices, the windows don't open. We are in, in kind of a little office park where technically we can open the doors because we're just there on the ground floor, uh, but that may not be feasible for many uh, businesses. Um, they also suggest using portable high efficiency HEPA filter or fan or filtration systems to increase the clean air. That's a good idea. They're, those are not that expensive. I, ha I have those running uh, in a few places in my house. Uh, so you can easily get those. That, that's an easy no brainer. Um, and then they say, if you are doing work yourself on these uh, systems, uh, changing filters, for example, or even on these small HEPA filter uh, systems, make sure to wear PPE. Uh, and they specify an N95 respirator. So we're not talking about the cloth masks here. We're talking a bona fide respirator. Also, eye protection. And we're not talking about our, our normal glasses. We're talking about safety goggles, as well as disposable gloves. And treat all of that, you know, like a biohazard, in my view. They don't require you to put it in the red bags, but this isn't something that you want to have uh, lying around that every time somebody throws something else into the trash, it's going to perhaps bl plume up uh, particulate matter that might be on, on the filters. Um, also, restrooms, real important. Um, that has been found to be a fairly high source of contagion because every time you flush, or those air blowers, it blows uh, uh, the particulate around. Uh, there is some evidence that uh, fecal matter uh, can uh, be a source of contagion as well. So uh, having the exhaust fans in the restrooms running, fully functional, good idea, max capacity, OSHA says, and then set them to remain on. That is going to be a, a challenge for some of your companies. Um, I know in, in our restroom, which again is a shared one in an office building, not under my control, uh, when you turn the light out, it turns the fan off. Um, and you know, for, for green purposes, you usually have wanted to turn the lights out, uh, but maybe now you're not doing that. In some restrooms, there's automatic functions where it turns off those systems after a certain period of time passes and no, there's been no movement uh, within the room. So those, again, are things you may need to take a look at. So that is the new guidance from OSHA as of November 2020. Just came out on November 5th. So um, go back, take a look at that. There's a lot more to it, obviously. Now, let's take a shift uh, over uh, to the state plans, because uh, I know that's why most of you are here. Um, first of all, as I said, you've got these uh, uh, multi-state operations uh, that are going to be impacted by four different emergency temporary standards. Um, and uh, in Cal OSHA, uh, we'll talk about that, they've had an aerosol transmissible disease, or ATD rule, that's been on the books for a couple of years. That came out in the wake of, of uh, Ebola. But now Cal OSHA, on top of that, is looking to do an emergency temporary standard. Um, so. You know, you're going to have two different sets of Cal OSHA rules to deal with. Um, in addition, uh, as I mentioned, there is that general duty clause imputation uh, from one state to the next, but there's also tort issues. And, you know, taking my safety professional hat on, putting my lawyer hat on, um, this is your biggest exposure because what OSHA can do to you pales in comparison to what a jury of your peers can do. Um, and so if you are, uh, one of the many companies that I work with who have uh, temporary workers from staffing agencies, maybe working alongside your own employees, um, subcontractors, day laborers, the guys that you picked up in the hardware store parking lot, um, you don't have a workers' comp shield against illness from the, with, with, for those folks. And so if they contract COVID, maybe they end up with long COVID, permanent long disabilities or they have a stroke or other complications due to the blood clotting that renders them permanently disabled, they have a personal injury action against your company or perhaps, you know, God forbid, if they pass away, a wrongful death action that is not normally going to be dischargeable under workers' comp uh, because they're going to be outside the scope of that. Um, and if they are able to show that you afforded people at their work site a lesser level of protection, than what you were doing for your 
your crews at other places, that is when you get into punitive and compensatory damages. Um, now, you know, Virginia, D.C., Maryland, those are contributory negligence states. And, you know, I'm not going to go too deep down this path, but if the employee themselves is negligent, uh, or, and I don't mean employee, but if the worker who's bringing a tort action is negligent, uh, even if it's, you know, just one or two percent, that is a bar to recovery. Um, you know, so if you furnish them, for example, with respiratory protection and they didn't use it and you can document that, that that might be one option. But, you know, you'd have to show that you were enforcing your rules, et cetera, as well. Now, turning to our friends uh, in Pennsylvania, that is a comparative negligence jurisdiction. And so even if the worker turns out to have been somewhat negligent, uh, if there's a jury award, there's going to be a comparison. So let's say they, the jury finds that the worker was 40 percent negligent, but the employer in your in this case uh, was 60 percent negligent. That uh, staffing agency worker or that day laborer uh, would get 60 percent of whatever the jury award was. So don't think that you're totally off the hook on those things. Um, there's also, of course, uh, the bigger issue where where you now have between Virginia, Oregon, Michigan, California, we'll, we'll kind of leave them off to the side because Cal Ocean does a lot of things the other states will never jump on board with. Uh, but it's a template. It's something that these other state plan states could follow. I'm expecting Washington state to, to jump on board here um, any day now, frankly, because uh, it's hard to believe that they wouldn't uh, when California and Oregon are going to have them. So um, Maryland, what about Maryland? I don't know. Uh, we'll see uh, what Governor Hogan decides to do there. Um, and, you know, how is a permanent standard going to differ from these? Well, the distinction is most of these emergency standards were, were fast-tracked. Some of them, uh, Oregon, they did hold a series of stakeholder meetings. Virginia, there was also some input, but that's one of the criticisms in the lawsuit is that they really did not reach out the way they should have. Um, and so, you know, you'll have an opportunity to weigh in as they do these permanent rulemakings at the state level. Make sure you take that option. Uh, you know, you can't just sit back and complain about a rule if you are not part of the process. So uh, everybody, you know, has a stake in this. Step up, let the state know pro or con what you think about uh, their proposal. Um, now, beyond that, uh, Let's take a look at these individual rules, and uh, I'm going to start off with California, um, and then we'll uh, we'll move our way uh, over to Virginia and finish up with that. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, Virginia, excuse me, California had a rule on the books even before COVID was a word that we knew, and that was their uh, uh, aerosol transmissible disease standard, or the ATD. It's in the California Code, Title Eight. Subtitle 5199. Um, Cal OSHA, because they did have an existing infrastructure that they could use for enforcement, they put out a lot of guidance about COVID and they explained uh, early on how it dovetailed with the ATD standard. Now, here was the, uh, the gremlin. Cal OSHA's ATD standard was limited in applicability to hospitals, to nursing facilities, medical offices, in other words, the healthcare field, the hospices, the nursing homes and, and long-term facilities. Uh, they also applied it to the emergency uh, medical services, your EMTs uh, and first responders. Uh, and again, Cal OSHA, state plan states, they do have jurisdiction over their public sector workers, uh, including firefighters, police, et cetera. Uh, correctional facilities and laboratories. So those are all the things that are currently covered under the aerosol transmissible disease rule. They did have, um, you know, a, a, a kick out provision here in a sense where uh, California's governor could expand the scope of that ATD standard, uh, but they would have to inform the employers in writing uh, that they had to comply with that standard. Um, and that really hasn't been done yet um, because, as we'll talk about in another couple of slides, they're doing their own uh, emergency standard now. Uh, but reporting, I, I talked earlier about uh, how to do your due diligence um, 
under federal OSHA or other states to determine the work relatedness of a case. Well, Cal OSHA has taken a bit of a different approach. They have said that a COVID case is going to be presumed work related if any workplace exposure is identified, even if the cause of it may be more likely attributable to non workplace or community transmission. And so what they have directed employers to do is first look at the interactions that the worker had with people who were known to be infected in your workplace and outside of the workplace. Um, were they working in the same area with people who were known to carry the virus? Were they sharing tools, materials, vehicles with known carriers? Uh, was one person operating the skid steer in the morning and then it, you know wasn't disinfected and the other person jumped on it and you know you would be looking at a link of, of disease in that kind of situation. You know, even things like a shift change where the same workstation with a computer and a phone maybe are used by multiple workers and they weren't uh, disinfected. The time clocks, how about ladders? You know, how about a toolbox where multiple workers might be grabbing tools out of the same toolbox? So those are things that you have to look at. Um, and then the second cut on it is uh, once you've identified some links, uh, consider the type of contact. Were they just passing in the hallway? Were masks being worn? What was the duration of the contact? Uh, was there distancing involved? Were there other controls that were being utilized that would have lessened the likelihood of work-related transmission? Um, those are all the things that you're going to be looking at. And so I would recommend that regardless of the state you're in, that's a pretty good way to do your decision tree in terms of, of identifying whether it could be a work transmissible uh, illness. Now, Cal OSHA also has come right out and said a positive COVID test is not required to trigger Cal OSHA reporting. And so if you have somebody who says, I've got COVID, I think I can't get a test for whatever reason, but I've got all the symptoms and I'm now you know, out of work, or maybe I'm in the hospital, uh, you would put that on your log. Um, in addition, uh, you have to protect workers from all different airborne uh, uh, infectious diseases, as well as COVID. Um, and then they have the main provisions. They have a written plan, uh, worker training, including training on the plan, engineering and work practice controls. Those are barriers. That's ventilation systems, as we've talked about. Um, water is not usually a, a, a thing, but you know, you're going to be doing cleaning. Uh, that's part of your work practice controls, maybe cutting back the shifts uh, to lessen the number of people, allowing people to work uh, remotely where that is, continues to be feasible, um, even staggering shifts or staggering arrival time. So everybody's not glomming around the time clock at the same time. Um, the the uh, Cal OSHA rule also require, and this is again, the aerosol transmissible disease rule that also has personal protective equipment uh, specifications Medical services, uh, the Cal OSHA rule requires the employer to uh, pay for vaccination. Now, right now we don't have a vaccine uh, that's available, but down the road in California, you would have to pay for that. Also infection determination and treatment. Um, and then there are special requirements for laboratories. That's all under the ATD rule. Now, taking a look at what Cal OSHA is doing, uh, on, on developing their own COVID specific standard. Um, on September 17th, uh, the Cal OSHA Standards Board voted to approve the union's petition for an emergency standard specific to COVID. And the big change up from the ATD rule is that this one is going to cover all workplaces. It's going to cover all sectors uh, that are not covered by the ATD rule. Um, and of course, there's going to be a, a continued review of this rule. Um, Cal OSHA's board has said at four month intervals to determine whether it should be continued, to determine uh, whether it should be made permanent, to determine whether it needs a, a modification in some way, because again, we're all learning about COVID on a daily basis. Now, in addition, in California, Governor Newsom uh, signed legislation requiring a lengthy list of notices to workers who are exposed. So again, now this is in direct conflict right now in the real time with what federal OSHA is requiring or, or, or not requiring in terms of employee notice. Um, also, um, Cal OSHA can not shut, shut, uh, shut down uh, work sites if there's an imminent hazard due to COVID. And that's where you know employee hazard complaints are gonna play a very big role. 
Um, Cal OSHA standard is going to be considered for finalization no later than November 19th. So just, you know, a, a, another week or so from now before Thanksgiving. Um, and then they will review um, in terms of the rule, um, how to address prevailing guidance, the worker notification issue, uh, not only for uh, workers, but also for other employers. And that's a big facet that's in uh, the, the Virginia rule as well, as we'll see, where if you're a multi-employer work site and you have uh, you know, subcontractors working under you, one of your people are positive, you're gonna have to give notice to those other employers as well. So Cal OSHA is looking at formalizing that uh, also. Um, current best industry practices, uh, maybe updating again uh, what's in this, this uh, draft rule uh, to adopt uh, the latest and greatest. Um, and then considering how to address the most vulnerable or impacted industries and professions. In California, movie making, the recording industry, you know, uh, television, they have been heavily impacted by this, performing arts generally. Uh, that's not just in California, but of course across the country. Uh, but those are where they're gonna be looking at maybe for some carve outs in those situations. Um, now let's move uh, up the coast. We're going up I-5, I if you've ever uh, done that drive before, it's a, a lovely drive when it's not on fire, um, to Oregon. And Oregon's rule was adopted Saturday. Yeah, we're, we're in real time stuff here. Um, and it's going to take effect on uh, uh, November 16th. There's going to be a phase in for certain parts of the rule. This is like the Virginia rule we'll, we'll talk about in a few minutes. Quite a complicated standard. Uh, there's a lot going on in it. Um, it's going to continue in effect until May 4th, 2021. So again, you know, looking at, at the thing, the Cal OSHA rules are gonna be reviewed for modification or maybe rescission or expansion every four months. The Virginia rule is gonna expire of its own weight uh, in February, unless it is extended by uh, Governor Northam. And now Oregon, it's gonna be in effect through May of next year as an emergency temporary standard. So again, I recommend if you're a, a multi-state employer, just like you kind of do with medical cannabis, put a chart together on what the unique requirements are state by state by state and keep updating that on a regular basis uh, uh, because you know things are changing. Uh, so what are we looking at? Um, this also, this Aura OSHA rule continues generally what had been the state guidance, which, as I mentioned earlier, has always been enforceable by them to the tune of nearly 100 citations to date. Uh, so the physical distancing, uh, six foot rule, uh, use of face coverings and sanitation, uh, that's applicable in all workplaces, regardless of risk level. Um, but the big changes um, have have been made. Uh, they had a draft that was out earlier this year. Um, and then they did hold a series of stakeholder meetings. So all in all, uh, Oregon OSHA went through four different drafts of this rule before adopting uh, the version that I'm about to talk about. And so this is another thing. If I don't know about you guys, I have at least four binders full of COVID information, plus a whole box of stuff that I didn't even organize yet. And I'm realizing much of what is in my binders, I could throw out the window other than for historical purposes, uh, because none of it's really applicable anymore. Um, so if you were starting to benchmark a program to one of the draft Oregon OSHA uh, versions, throw that out, take a look at the final version and use that. So what do you have to do in Oregon? You have to ensure six foot distancing uh, between all your individuals in the workplace. So that's your, your own employees, that's third party employees, that's customers, members of the public. Um, you do this through workplace design and workflow. You stop if it becomes infeasible, but this is engineering controls are, are numero uno. You don't go straight to face coverings and respirators. It's like anything else. Uh, you know, you're gonna be using that pyramid, of the hierarchy of controls. If you can't eliminate it, and clearly right now we can't eliminate COVID, you know, you're gonna to have to be starting with these engineering uh, controls. Then you're gonna to have to require that face coverings be worn in the workplace by all individuals. That's your full-time and part-time employees. Uh, that's your temps, again, third parties and customers. And this is at any establishment that is under your control. So obviously this, if you're a construction company, 
this doesn't just apply at your company offices and you know your own trailer but if you're sending work crews out where they are in control of the environment it would apply there as well um, you're going to have to provide the face masks or coverings or shields and they refer to all three they have different functions and you're going to have to be uh, familiar with the different roles that they serve and the, the protections that they afford but those have to be provided to your employees at no cost uh, in Oregon. Um, if you are having workers travel in a motor vehicle together for work purposes, everybody in the motor vehicle has to wear a face covering uh, unless they are members of the same household. Now, an earlier version of this said that nobody could sit within three feet of each other, and uh, it appears that they took that out of the final version, probably because you know, that, would, that wouldn't allow more than one person to be in, in most uh, passenger vehicles. Um, in addition to that, um, you have to maximize the effectiveness of your existing ventilation systems, maintain or replace air filters, clean your intake ports, uh, but you do not have to install uh, or purchase a new system. You just have to maintain your existing ones. Now, again, that, that federal OSHA guidance on ventilation systems that just came out last week they're gonna be reading that in harmony with the Oregon OSHA rule. Um, and then there is a specific or OSHA uh, uh, COVID-19 hazards poster. Uh, it's available from the state um, and it is available in English and in Spanish. Clearly, uh, as with every one of these rules, any training, any warnings, any communications, notices have to be given to your workers in a language and a vocabulary that they understand just like any other OSHA training that you'd be doing. Um, in addition, under the OR OSHA final uh, emergency standard, you have to have a written infection control plan. You have to seek participation and, and feedback from your employees on it. Um, you have to conduct a risk assessment initially to address when workers might have to wear PPE and also describe your other specific hazard controls. Uh, for those of you uh, who might be in the construction sector, all of these rules, this one in Virginia especially, to me, are very analogous to the silica uh, approach. So if you've had experience with that, you know, this this will start being second nature to you. Um, you have to provide information and training to your workers. Um, train them about your personal protective equipment, how to use it efficaciously, its limitations, uh, the face coverings. They're not protecting the wearer. They're protecting the other guy. And 95 masks, they're protecting the wearer but they're not protecting the other guy because they have exhaust valves uh, typically. Um, I have heard people say now, uh, and this was when I say people say, uh, uh, this was uh, NIOSH yesterday at a meeting I sat in on talking about taking those EKG stickers and putting it on the inside of the N95 to, to cover the uh, uh, exhaling valve. Um, and that way you're not gonna be dispersing 60% of your infected particulate to your coworkers. It also is modifying the design of an N95, and it's going to make it harder to wear them and breathe. So, you know, I'm not really sure where NIOSH is going with that, but that came out during a, a advisory committee meeting I sat in on yesterday uh, with those folks. Um, in addition, um, you're going to have to uh, tell people how your uh, controls are going to be implemented in the workplace. Give the workers an opportunity for feedback. You can, <laughs> you're going to love this. Um, Dave, I can almost hear you laughing at this one. You're going to have to designate either a social distancing officer. This is in Oregon, okay? Or you, if you have an existing safety and health committee, you can use that. Um, you know, you can have some kind of interactive safety meeting if you don't have either uh, or both. But uh, you're going to have to do this again in a language and vocabulary that the worker workers will understand. Um, you have to explain the company's policies and procedures. Uh, on how to report the signs or symptoms of COVID. And again, language and vocabulary that the workers will understand. Uh, you have to notify affected workers within 24 hours of a COVID-related infection. And you also have to cooperate with your public health uh, officials if they want to come in and do testing in your workplace. Ooh, so that's a unique requirement that we have here in Oregon. Uh, but again, Oregon, you have to notify your workers of a COVID-related infection. Federal OSHA says no. Virginia, they've got their own thing. You're going to be notifying your workers, and you're going to be notifying the public health department. So 
again, lots of details that you're going to have to really read into these. The Virginia rule alone is 47 pages long. Um, so this isn't, uh, you know, a, a very user friendly approach to things in my view, but, you know, it's, we are looking at something that is potentially fatal. Um, in addition, the Oregon OSHA rule has some specific requirements for what they consider to be high risk jobs, um, detailed infection control plans, sanitation procedures uh, for routine cleaning and disinfecting. And remember, those terms, cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing are terms of art. In the Virginia rule, they, uh, they have 40 different definitions, and each of those terms are defined in that rule. So a good, good uh, thing to take a look at. Um, they're also uh, advising robust use of PPE, whatever that means. Um, you have to operate your ventilation systems according to national standards. It's interesting that OR OSHA wrote that in before there was any national standard. And now we do have something, uh, you know, the 13 MERV uh, based on the thing that, that federal OSHA put out this week. OR OSHA also requires the use of barriers, typically those plexiglass barriers, but say if you work in a cubicle farm, um, they're going to have specifications there. And what we consider cubicles, um, although they are a barrier to seeing your coworkers, as we know, they're not a barrier to hearing your coworkers, um, the germs can travel over the top of a four and a half or five foot barrier. So those do not uh, uh, meet the bill here. You're also going to have to have an isolation room in case you have workers who uh, are viewed to be symptomatic uh, while they are in the workplace until you can safely get them home or get them to the hospital. Um, and then there's uh, screening and triaging for uh, uh, COVID-19 symptoms uh, uh, that you're gonna have to do as an employer as well. So again, federal OSHA recommends doing some screening or at least, you know, for certain sectors they do. And, you know, if they're importing the latest CDC guidance, but, you know, it's it's, very, very confusing. Here, they're just saying, you got to do it. So you got to do it. Um, this chart here, and I apologize for the quality of it, uh, but if you're able to zoom in on it uh, later, you'll be able to see. It's very useful, actually. They have a code on which provisions uh, take effect on the 16th of November. Some of them take effect on November 23rd, a week later. Why? I don't know. Uh, happy Thanksgiving. Um, and then some of them take effect on December 7th, some on December 21st, and some of them on January 6th. Um, so you can read across here um, and look for the asterisks and the crosses and figure out uh, uh, who shot John and all of that. But um, I figured that's the easiest way to portray that information for you. Um, now, moving on, we're coming east now uh, over to Michigan, um, which certainly has caught a share of heat over COVID uh, and executive branch actions. Um, they adopted emergency rules that covered all businesses. And then there are specific requirements on top of those for the manufacturing, construction, retail, and healthcare sectors. Um, just like with uh, the Virginia rule that we'll talk about. And, you know, I want to suggest, because I've, I've fleshed out a bit more in the Virginia rule, but these other ones in their risk assessment, Oregon, uh, Michigan, they're using very similar terminology and, and classification. So I think if you benchmark to the Virginia rule, which I think is one of the most protective, you're probably going to be good for most of these others. But again, there will be a few unique requirements, especially with Oregon, for example. Um, so what do you have to do in Michigan? Um, and this is the rule. It's going to be in effect for six months from October. But that's April. So again, Virginia rule, unless it's extended, expires in February. Michigan in April. Oregon in May. Cal OSHA isn't even adopted yet, so that'll be pushed out even further. Um, you have to determine exposure for your workers in uh, both routine and also anticipated tasks, um, and then classify them as either the lower, medium, high, or very high uh, sectors. Um, and there are going to be unique requirements for each, just like there are in Virginia. Um, you have to have a COVID-19 uh, preparedness and response plan. This has to be in writing. It has to include your exposure determination, the detailed measures you're going to take 
uh, including your engineering controls, your work practice and administrative controls, um, also hand hygiene, and then specifying the PPE that will be required, um, addressing health surveillance, screening protocols, and reporting. And then you have to train your workers on the whole shebang. Um, so again, going back to my favorite topic, silica, uh, for those of you who might be dealing with that, and you're familiar with OSHA's approach to table one, you can list, take the same approach, list each task and then go through it. What are your engineering, your work practice controls, your sanitation requirements? The next column is your PPE. And that gives you a fairly easy checklist to make sure that everybody's doing what they should be doing. Um, in Michigan, you have to have a workplace coordinator for COVID-19. Um, Virginia, by the way, calls it a competent person. And, you know, we, we saw it in Oregon, they have another name for it. Um, it doesn't matter, but they have to, you know, what term you use, but they have to be uh, capable of implementing your plan. They have to be uh, empowered to enforce the plan. Uh, you know, so that means it's going to be someone typically who's going to be an agent of management. Uh, can it be the competent person that you use for other construction activities? Sure. Why not? If they're smart enough, if they're, if they're capable of handling something in, in this uh, sector, um, because they are going to be uh, your designated felon, kind of. Uh, they are going to have responsibility. And if you have a uh, staffing agency worker die from COVID and they file a wrongful death action against the company, they might file it against your uh, workplace coordinator in their personal capacity as well. And remember, you don't have the worker's comp shield here. Um, so what else does the, the employer have to do in Michigan? Um, same stuff we've been talking about. Consider telework. The fewer people you have in the workplace, the, the less likelihood you're going to have transmission in the workplace. The more, the easier it is going to be to socially distance workers if they're not piled on top of each other. You're going to have to mandate face coverings as required under your control plan. Um, and you're going to have to have procedures for sick workers to report, of course, without retaliation, to self-isolate, um, and for notification of other workers. Bam, here you have Michigan saying you have to notify other workers. So again, we've got a tension between federal OSHA uh, and the state plans. Um, and then coming into the home stretch here, Virginia OSHA. Um, no, I know you'll be disappointed, but I'm not gonna give you the four hour version of this. Um, I wanna try to hit though a few of the high points in this very long 20, you know, 47 page rule. Um, it took effect in part Back in July, um, it was rolled out in phases, but the final provisions took effect and are, are enforceable as of September 25th, 2020. So the whole thing is in effect, and it is intended that they will replace this with a permanent standard before it expires in February. We will see, obviously, litigation uh, could impact that as well. Now, the table of contents of a rule isn't normally very exciting, but I wanted you to see that there's a lot in here. There, it starts off with the general feel good purpose, why we're doing this and the scope. Who does it cover? When is it applicable? Those are very important things. Uh, the effective dates, I've given them to you uh, in part, but you wanna look at them section by section. Right now though, it's all in effect. So that has less uh, import than it would have before. A big important section, to look at is the definitions. And as I said, there's 40 different definitions in here. The risk level uh, classifications, those are critical. Um, the distinctions between cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing, those are important terms. They define technical and economic feasibility. Those are really important terms, uh, especially for the lawyers. Um, and so you wanna read through those, even though definitions are usually a part of a rule that we kind of blow through. Um, and then you get into the meat and potatoes, the mandatory requirements, and they specify for very high and high risk exposures. Um, section 60 is the medium exposure risk, and that is going to be the majority of your non-office and non-medical workplaces. Uh, construction falls in there, retail falls in there, manufacturing falls in there. So for most of you, that's where your, your efforts are going to be focused. But interestingly, there's not a heck of a lot of difference between what's required in the medium workplaces and what's required in the high and very high exposure. Um, and the ventilation systems, especially, 
are impacted in all three of those sectors. Uh, so again, what Federal OSHA just put out is going to uh, have some uh, some impact for you um, as you are under this Virginia rule. Um, you also, uh, like these other states, you have to have an infectious disease preparedness and response plan. The workers have to be trained on the hazards of COVID, uh, the measures that you're taking in your workplace to prevent the spread, and of course, on how to implement and abide by your uh, preparedness and response plan. And then finally, they have added anti-discrimination provisions that are kind of on steroids. Uh, they, they really go beyond what is in federal OSHA's uh, interpretation uh, of some of the protections. Um, so I wanted to hit just a few of these uh, uh, high, high uh, level uh, uh, provisions of the Bosch Emergency Temporary Standard. Um, and then at the end of that, uh, we'll open this up for questions that you might have. So, first of all, why are they doing this? Well, they're doing this to control, prevent, and mitigate the spread of, of COVID-19. And they actually, in the Virginia rule, went into some discussion that the governor's uh, statement, especially, kind of pointing the fingers uh, at federal OSHA and saying, we're having to do this to jump into the void because federal OSHA is refusing to fill this very uh, you know, obvious gap in their standards. Um, and so it spells out you know, the things that are in the rule, the risk assessment, the engineering and administrative and work practice controls, training and reporting and recording. They, they clarify it applies to every employer in the state of Virginia. It applies to every employee and place of employment um, within the jurisdiction of Bosch. So what is not within the jurisdiction of Bosch? Well, if there is a federally controlled work site in Virginia, an airport, a military base, those are not under Bosch, so this rule doesn't apply there. Um, similarly, uh, ports, maritime operations, Virginia OSHA is somewhat unique in not covering those. Uh, so federal OSHA would apply uh, in those operations. Um, so those are, are two of the big exceptions. And the third one, are things that are under the Mine Safety and Health Administration, MSHA. That's a federal agency and it's over cement plants, stone quarry, sand and gravel operations, et cetera, as well as your more traditional coal mines that you would expect to see in, in Virginia. Now, Virginia has what's called a DMME. It's a division uh, or Department of Mining and, and Mineral Exploration. And they do have some state specific mine safety rules uh, in some cases that go beyond what federal MSHA has, kind of like uh, with, with Virginia OSHA and federal OSHA. Um, no word yet on whether they are going to do an emergency standard, but now that federal MSHA rejected the call uh, for an ETS uh, by the unions uh, and also uh, they won in court and rejected the petition for an emergency standard, I could see uh, Virginia DMME getting into the act on this, uh, especially because we have had COVID clusters uh, in some of the uh, coal mines in Virginia um, and workers who have compromised lungs to begin with may be at a greater risk of developing uh, severe cases of COVID, uh, death, uh, or again, long COVID where they end up with permanently wrecked lungs. Um, so keep an eye on that if you work with uh, any of the coal or, or uh, metal and the non-metal mines uh, in the state of Virginia. That could be coming. Um, in addition, where how this rule applies, as I've already suggested, really depends on which risk level uh, your company falls into or your workplace falls into. Um, you're going to have to, in doing your risk assessment, consider what exposure routes there are for airborne transmission of COVID-19. Uh, what other contact with contaminated surfaces or objects could there be? Are there shared locker rooms or break rooms, lunch rooms, uh, the entrances and the exits, uh, the workstations that might be shared, time clocks, et cetera, shared work vehicles? Uh, you know, uh, maybe you use off road construction equipment, but the operator of the excavator changes depending upon uh, uh, the time of day. Well, you know, it's going to have to be cleaned up before uh, that changes out. Um, and then employer-sponsored uh, shared transportation. Uh, consider that because these are very high uh, uh, sources of transmission. Uh, one of my clients uh, out west who has a cluster 
It started because they had one infected worker. He drove four other coworkers to work every day because they were in kind of a rural area. Um, and suddenly they had five people with COVID and all five of them worked in different areas of that operation. So it ended up spreading it uh, to other workers. So those are the things that you have to be considering. Um, now the workplace classifications, this is out of the uh, definition sector. The very high is what you would expect. It's not only medical, but it's those procedures, those special things that really have an elevated risk. The people who are intubating uh, patients, for example, or they're doing the autopsies, or they are working in the laboratories where they are analyzing the testing samples, um, you know, or, or uh, tissue samples that could be infected. Uh, so most of you are not going to fall into that very high category. The high category, again, typically the healthcare sector, first responders, mortuary, corrections would fall into that category. Drug treatment programs would fall into that category. Um, those are basically any place where your employees are uh, expected. They're going to be within six feet of somebody who either has COVID uh, or is suspected of having it. Um, and then the medium classification, as I said, that's the majority of companies that are not in the offices or in the medical or high risk sectors. Um, that's where you could have more than minimal contact within six feet of other employees, other persons, including subcontractors or temps, uh, or the general public um, who may be infected but are not known or suspected to be infected. Um, and then finally, the lowest classification, lower, um, that's where you really don't have to be within six feet of anybody else, um, offices, workplaces that have minimal contact. Um, maybe most of the people, as in my office, are teleworking. Um, and so you have a core group. I mean, that's kind of, of how my office is right now. Um, there's there's two, empl two uh, uh, attorneys who are coming in daily. I'm not one of them. Um, and then I have an office manager who has her own office. Um, I have a legal, clerk, a legal assistant. He has his own office. And then I have a third uh, administrative person and she's in a totally different wing. Um, so we're able to do that where people don't have to wear masks all the time if they're in their own offices. But when they do go out into a common area like the kitchen, you have to mask up um, and, and follow the other uh, precautions, uh, you know, the sanitation, et cetera. Now, on the emergency standard in Virginia, uh, you do not have to conduct contact tracing. So that's interesting that they specifically put that in there. Um, you know, uh, this again flies in the face of, of kind of what CDC has recommended. And then they turn around and say, if a CDC recommendation is equal to or more stringent than what Vosch wants, uh, compliance with Vosch will be assumed. Uh, but, you know, uh, watch out because the CDC guidance is fluctuating constantly. Um, if the CDC guidance that you're following, however, is not as uh, stringent, it's not equivalent in protections to the Bosch rules, then compliance with the CDC guidelines will be considered maybe evidence of good faith. You might get that 10% reduction, but you can still be cited unless one of the other affirmative defenses applies. In terms of your risk assessment, um, you have to consider, again, all modes of transportation, uh, both by symptomatic and asymptomatic uh, persons. Uh, and uh, the risk level uh, is going to be based on the factors that are present um, in the course of employment, regardless of location. So, again, you have to consider all places that your worker is going to be when they are on the clock for you. If it's a salesperson and they're going into other people's workplaces, you're going to have to anticipate that. And there are provisions in this specific to mobile crews, by the way. Um, in addition, for reporting, and this is, again, unique to Virginia OSHA, you have to have a system in place to receive positive test results from your workers or others in the workplace. Again, staffing agency people, subcontractors, day laborers, uh, within 14 days of the positive test. And then you have to notify your own employees uh, that they've been exposed, but you have to keep confidential the identity of the infected person. You have to notify all other employers who had workers at your work site, and then uh, they're going to uh, tell their, their people uh, because they are an employer also covered under this. Um, if you are in a building or a facility that you don't own, you have to notify 
the building or facility owner. And then if they have other tenants in the building who are employers, they have to notify them of exposure. But they, again, will not identify the worker. Um, my office is in Maryland, not in Virginia. But we were notified fairly early on in all of this that one of the uh, uh, employees from the janitorial uh, contractor had tested positive. And so we had to respond to that because clearly, you know, they come and clean throughout our, our entire office. Um, but, but that was done voluntarily. Under the Bosch rule, you would have a, an obligation to do that. Um, in addition, and this is, again, unique to Virginia, you have to notify the health department within 24 hours of having a work-related case. And then you also have to notify them if you have three cases that are positive within a 14-day period so that they can investigate, you know, what you're, what you're doing, basically. Uh, do you have the appropriate controls? But also, you know, is this a cluster? Is this expanding? You know, is this related to maybe a community cluster? Or is this unique to your workplace? So uh, don't forget that you do have that uh, health department reporting requirement. In addition to any report, you might have to file uh, with Virginia OSHA. And again, federal OSHA has changed up their position on the hospitalization reports. Virginia OSHA, these other state plans, they haven't done that so far. Um, the training requirement under Virginia OSHA, um, if you are in the very high, high or medium classification, uh, you have to provide training on the COVID hazards and the characteristics of C-19 to all workers at your work site, um, regardless of the risk classification for their, in, their individual task. Again, it has to be in the language and vocabulary that they understand. And if you're using written materials, Virginia says, bear in mind illiteracy. Um, just because somebody speaks English doesn't mean that they read it, uh, even if they are native born. Uh, you have to train your employees to recognize the hazards of COVID-19 and how to minimize them, review the rule with them, review both the mandatory and non-mandatory recommendations of the CDC guidelines or the Virginia guidance. Um, if you're using CDC in lieu of Virginia, then you review CDC with them, go over the characteristics and the methods of transmission, the signs and symptoms, um, the fact that, you know, you can be asymptomatic, you can have it and not run a fever, for example, um, and, and be aware, you know, underlying health conditions that can impact this, um, and also the asymptomatic transmission. So that's all got to get covered in your training class. Um, and then the anti-discrimination provisions, um, this is kind of a big deal. They specifically have codified that you cannot discharge or in any way discriminate against an employee who exercises their rights under the emergency temporary standard, voluntarily uh, wants to wear their own PPE. You have to let them use that as long as it's, you know, at least as equivalent or greater protection. Um, and if they raise a reasonable concern about this, um, to the employer, that's protected. To the employer's agent, that's protected. Uh, you know, so, so that would be maybe a staffing agency. Uh, the government agency, if they go to Virginia OSHA or they go to the Virginia Public Health Department and make a complaint against the employer, that's protected. But also to the public, if they write an editorial and it's in, you know, the, the Richmond uh, newspaper, um, if they go online on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, other social media. Uh, and this is where, you know, if we had more time, I could get into the weeds a bit more, but there are distinctions under the National Labor Relations uh, Board uh, rulings within the last year on social media where it is protected activity if you're blasting the employer. So you could go on Facebook and say, you know, law office of Adele Abrams, you know, they, they it's, it, you know, it's the worst employer in the world and you know we hate it here and they're not doing anything on COVID and that is protected. But if you went online and you said, you know, uh, Jane Jones, uh, the, the office manager at the law office of Adele Abrams, you know, she's an awful person and she doesn't give two hoots about our safety. That is not protected um, because you're going after an individual rather than the company. So be aware there are some nuances to that. And moreover, Virginia has said, if the worker lies about the employer on social media, um, they can follow their normal protocols for discipline. 
uh, without Virginia OSHA charging them with discrimination. But they're going to do it through the prism of a mixed motive analysis. And if they find that the, the employer was motivated in any part by the employee's protected activity, then they could still find against the employer in that situation. Uh, it might limit some of the relief that the worker would be entitled to, however. And then finally, Virginia OSHA has formalized that work refusal protection that I talked about earlier. If they have a good faith, reasonable fear of injury or death, or in this case, illness, um, and they've communicated it to the employer, the employer doesn't do anything, they can refuse to work and they cannot be terminated, demoted, or, or in, in other ways uh, uh, retaliated against by the employer. So uh, I know you probably thought that I was never going to uh, end here, uh, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, see what we're dealing with in terms of uh, questions that might be out there. Um, and I will turn this back uh, over, I guess, to Dave or whoever is going to be out there uh, doing the questions. All right. Hi, Adele. It's Dan. <laughs> Not Dan. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're, cha you're changing up on me there, keeping me on my toes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Adele, thank you so much. Um, I do have several questions in the Q&A, and I did jot some down that uh, came across in the chat as well. Um, so I'll start off in the Q&A section, and the first question I have is uh, uh, just, uh, an attendee wanted to know, can you please provide examples of the type of findings compliance officers are citing? Well, you know, these cases have not been litigated, you know, so we don't have published decisions at this point. Um, I can tell you that uh, in the, the DC case that I have, which is federal OSHA, um, they're looking at this under the general duty clause, I think. Um, but uh, right now they're just running down the complaint that, they, that we had a positive case and that we didn't notify other employees about it. Um, you know, these other rules have not really taken effect yet. Federal OSHA um, has done some enforcement, uh, mostly in, in the meatpacking and the protein sectors. And, you know, they can enforce there. Uh, typically, they're going after the respiratory protection uh, not being used appropriately. Uh, the sanitation standard is another one that they are, are uh, looking at. Uh, but we don't have published decisions yet because it typically takes a year or two for these cases to go through the court. So um, at this point, it's a little premature to determine what allegations of these different OSHA agencies will ultimately be upheld. All righty. All right, so next, uh, there was, a, there was a, a request from one of the attendees, if you could uh, give some samples of objective evidence. Okay, and that is, I assume, in doing your triage to determine whether a case is work related for report recording purposes. Um, the triage that we talked about in the Cal OSHA rule, I think follows. Um, let's use an example, um, working in proximity to other workers who have COVID. You have a conveyor line. You don't have uh, plexiglass barriers up between workers. And so there, there is the potential for, for uh, uh, aerosol transmissibility, and you have uh, a worker who is uh, assigned to work, um, you know, maybe three or four feet from another worker. I always like to think about uh, Lucy on the candy line, Lucy and Ethel. You know, if you're right next to each other like that, um, and, and Lucy gets sick, and now Ethel suddenly uh, claims that she has symptoms of COVID, you've got exposure, you've got proximity, then you would look at, you know, were they wearing personal protective equipment? Um, if they weren't, or if they were just wearing the cloth masks, which I hate to say it, at best have about a 60% efficacy from, from the latest I heard from NIOSH yesterday, um, you know, then it's more likely than not that her case is work-related. Now let's turn it around. Lucy is sick, Ethel complains of symptoms, but she was 12 feet away from Lucy, You've beefed up your your ventilation system. You've got you know your uh, your HEPA filters running. You've got uh, plexiglass barriers uh, between you know they were wearing uh, N95s maybe. Now you've lessened the uh, totality of the objective evidence uh, that could be weighed in determining whether it is work related. Maybe you find out that uh, Ethel's husband 
is homesick, poor Fred, uh, with COVID. Now you've got a source of off the job transmission. Um, so you could put that into your evaluation as well. But these moving parts are going to be all over the place, clearly. Um, you know, it's going to be a case by case assessment, and it's going to be predicated on the unique characteristics of your workplace, the interface of your workers. Uh, you know, another example that I've, I've raised a couple of times here would be where, say, mobile equipment is being shared, uh, you know, a, a haul truck or a front end loader. Um, if you if you're immediately jumping into the cab that somebody else jumped out of and that first person ends up being sick, the likelihood that that, that the second person's case is work related is fairly high. But if, you know, if there was four hours in between and the doors and windows were open and somebody went in there with, you know, the uh, the EPA uh, endless disinfectants. And that's another whole thing that's in the Virginia rule sprayed and wiped down everything before the second driver went in there. Then you could you could say it's less likely that that was work related transmission. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So I have a little scenario here. Uh, one of the attendees, uh, if an employee gets sick, riding back and forth to a job location with an employee that is sick. And on the project, they maintain 6 foot distancing and wear their mask and eye gear, but riding, they did not. Is that still considered a work related exposure? Um, it may well be, and, you know, clearly this is addressed. Um, actually, we, you know, if we had the four hour course, I'd be going into it. In the Virginia rule, they address mobile crews. Um, in the Oregon rule, they address mobile crews and sharing uh, transportation. So now you'd have to take a step back and look at, was this shared transportation, uh, you know, mandated by the employer? Uh, or, or encouraged by the employer? Were you paying people to carpool, for example? We do that in Virginia all the time, right? You know, the slug lines. Um, so if the employers are doing, encouraging that, or maybe, you know, I, I did a, a, a case a number of years ago with a company that cleans parking lots and they would have a supervisor in a, in a big van and he would drive around and pick up their employees at their at specified sites each day and then take them to the job site. So, you know, if it's facilitated by the employer and you have people who are unprotected sharing an enclosed vehicle, uh, that is going to be a work related case in my view. Now, if you just have a couple of people who casually are neighbors and, you know, they decide to commute together, you, you've got a bit a bit of attenuation there between it being under the employer's control. All right, great. Thank you. All right. So next, uh, if the employer is providing and requiring face coverings from cloth masks to surgical mask, is that enough to be deemed adequate control measures or does it have to be an N95 respirator level? Well, this is again where the devil is in the details. It is going to depend on where the triage uh, uh, is from your risk assessment. You might in the same workplace have some employees who have to wear an N95 for reasons unrelated to COVID, maybe uh, under your silica control plan. Uh, that's fine. That'll protect them against COVID as well. You're going to have people in the healthcare sector who are wearing surgical masks. Those are a different thing from the face coverings. N95 masks are NIOSH approved, uh, and they protect the wearer, not the, not the people outside of the wearer. The surgical masks uh, basically protect uh, the, the, the person who's wearing them from contaminating a surgical field. Those are FDA approved, but they do not afford you any real respiratory protection for the wearer. And then the face coverings are not approved by anybody. And, you know, we, we know they're all over the place. I have some really cool ones that I've bought, but, you know, a plain old bandana works too. Um, so you're going to have to look at uh, the likelihood of work transmission. What are they going to be doing? How close are they going to be to to members of the public? Do they have to wear an N95 because they are in the medical field, you know, or the construction field, or are they wearing, you know, maybe they're wearing a, a, a welding mask, you know, because of lead fumes, that's another type of PPE. So you're gonna have to integrate the mandated PPE respirators for other OSHA standards. That doesn't go away, that obligation. And then you layer on top of that COVID and for those workers who normally would not be wearing respiratory protection, 
likely they're just going to be wearing the face coverings. They're not going to wear the surgical mask. They're not going to wear an N95. Uh, but again, this is constantly evolving. And OSHA has done a bit of a back step on this and said, uh, you know, if you can wear N95s, maybe you should. So stay tuned. You know, we'll, we'll do another webinar in another month and it'll be completely different again. This is, I think, the fourth one I've done. And, and as, you know, the Chesapeake Region Safety Council folks can attest, every time there's brand spanking new information here because the government keeps changing its mind on how it wants to address these things. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So regarding the Oregon rule for 24 hours, uh, the question is, is this business hours or even on the weekends, there needs to be a process in place to notify? Um, uh, I would say it is 24 hours. It's not uh, not the next business day. If they wanted it to be the next business day, they, they would have written it that way. And it's the same thing, like, you know, with to use an analogy with with federal OSHA's normal severe injury reporting rule. If somebody uh, gets hospitalized on a Friday at 2.30, you have to notify them by Saturday at 2.30. You can't wait until Monday at 2.30 to notify them. So the same thing would apply here. All right, thank you. All right, so next one I have is, are you aware of any modifications to the upcoming OSHA 300A postings, which are due February 1st due to COVID-19? Um, at this point, who knows? <coughs> Excuse me, that's not COVID. Um, right now, I would continue reporting, uh, uh, excuse me, recording the cases that in your triage and assessment you've determined are work related. But you put them on the log as an occupational illness. You would log the days away from work or restricted duty the same as you would uh, for anything else. If you're allowing people to continue working, but they're working from home. Uh, instead of working in the workplace because they're they're waiting out their period of time, um, you know, then that would go down as restricted duty. Uh, so the definitions really haven't changed. The main change up, as I said uh, just recently, has been that they no longer want you reporting as a, a severe injury the hospitalization cases because, in their view, you can't be hospitalized within 24 hours of being exposed to COVID. I do expect that to change, though, under the next administration. Okay. Hey, hey, Dell. I think we're just about out of our time. <laughs> I think. I think probably. At least I probably have burned everybody out on it by now. <laughs> you know, wow. It's just. I. I mean, the information is just. Wow. It's a ton. And and I want to just say thank you incredibly for for all of the time and energy you put into this thing because it goes on and on and on and and I'm sure probably we could have you back in about two weeks and there'd be a ton more for you to share with everybody here. Uh, we are going to and and with your permission we'll post this uh, PowerPoint up on our our uh, website so that should be up on the website sometime today. And I, I just want to once again, Adele, thank you very much. It is greatly appreciated. Your your wealth of knowledge is, is, I am certain, it's helpful to me as a safety professional, and I'm sure all the other folks online with us today. So once again, thank you very much. I thank everybody for participating. And uh, if you have questions or concerns, I, Adele's uh, email's down below there, and, and uh, you can also uh, reach out to us at the Chesapeake Region Safety Council. So, once again, thank you very much. Have a great day and uh, hope everybody stays healthy.